pray for an extra 15 to 20 minutes following the service. We'll dismiss everybody after the sermon. We'll all go, whoa, that got hot for a second. Um, we'll dismiss everybody to go change. Um, while we're changing and getting ready to get into the water, which is right up here behind uh, the glass, Josh and the worship team will just be leading in congregational singing until we get ready and set. So if you can plan on doing that, plan to stay a little bit later, be an encouragement to these saints who are making, as we're going to talk about this afternoon, two declarations. When you hop into the water of baptism, you're making two declarations. Number one, I've trusted in Jesus Christ alone for my salvation. That's the first declaration you're making. Second one is that you want to walk with him. You want to be a disciple. That's coming out of Matthew 28, 19 and 20, the Great Commission. And so hopefully that wasn't an alarm for me to finish. (laughs) That's probably my alarm to get going, hopefully. All joking aside, we all recognize that noise though, don't we? It's like, uh uh-oh, what did I forget? All right, so if you're not there, go ahead and turn with me to the book of John. We're going to be in John chapter 12, as Todd uh, read for us. Um, it's an interesting passage because it doesn't seem like there's much there, but I will point out, even in your Bibles, many of you are going to have a couple of verses in italics, very significant, right? It either means one of two things in New Testament translations. It means that the words aren't there in the original, or it means that the author, the writer, the speaker is quoting from the Old Testament. And that's the case this morning. They're quoting from the Old Testament. This is kind of what makes this passage so significant. But Last time in our narrative, you remember we were at a dinner. That's where we, we left off last time. We we're at a dinner. Mary had done this incredible act of just loving devotion to the Lord. Remember, she, she busted that jar of ointment open. It was uh, over a, a year's worth of wages. That's how much it cost. Costly ointment anointed or pre-anointed Jesus's body for his upcoming death and burial. And so what we're doing now is we're coming to the next day. The very next day is where we pick up our account. This is what's known as his triumphal entry. This is his entry into Jerusalem for the Passion Week. We know this uh, as Palm Sunday. That's what we're going to be studying this morning, Palm Sunday. And so Jesus is going to spend the next five days going into Jerusalem and out of Jerusalem and into Jerusalem and out of Jerusalem. He's going to be teaching many. And so as I mentioned last time, we'll mention this a couple more times, but John 1 through 11 covered three years of the life of Jesus. Now, as we get into John 12 through about chapter 20, we're only going to cover one week in the life of Jesus. And so this whole narrative just slows down into kind of slow motion here. And so this this morning uh, in the message, I've entitled the message, Perfect Timing. And we're going to observe a lot of amazing things in this story on Palm Sunday. But I think the most amazing thing that we're going to see is the timing of it from a biblical perspective. And I want to make the argument this morning, and I think you'll hopefully agree with me at the end. God had this exact day in mind to present Jesus as the Messiah to the nation of Israel. 500 years, at least 500 years earlier, because that's when we have the prophecies recorded. And so we want to look at that this morning. This is why I think the, the timing of this is so significant as we consider it this morning. And so John chapter 12 and verse 12, we see this great multitude. In fact, we read in 12 through 13, the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And so this is the day after the supper, as I mentioned, it's right after the the night before was when Mary anointed him. This is the very next day, Palm Sunday. Um, again, all throughout Passion Week, we kind of get these timestamps to let us know where he's at in the week, what's going on. And unbeknownst to the disciples, and we're going to see that bear out in our passage. They don't know this, what, what I'm about to say. The crowd doesn't know it. The religious leaders don't know it. This is the exact day that God predicted the Messiah would enter Jerusalem and be presented to the nation of Israel as their Messiah. The exact day, over 500 years earlier. It was predicted that far in advance. Now, I want to pull up Daniel 9.25 because I want this circulating in your mind, but we'll develop it a little bit further, a few slides down. But notice this, Daniel 9.25, and just hang with me. There's some time stamps in here, and we'll kind of explain it. But this is the prophecy given to Daniel. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince... So there's a start to that, and there's an, an end time to that. And then he tells us how long is going to be in between these two events. There, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again 
and the wall, even in troublesome times. Now, one of the, one of the a former professor at Dallas Seminary, his name is Harold Honer. If you're interested in this math, okay, and it's, it's, it's a lot of math. So if you like math, you'll like his study. If you don't, you can just skip to the end if you want. But Harold Honer actually mapped this out in a book called The Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ. You can get it on Amazon, where he gives in detail this, this time frame that he's talking about here, and it leads us right to Palm Sunday. It's amazing. The accuracy of the Bible. In fact, the, the prophecy is so accurate that many liberal scholars say Daniel could not have been written when they said it was written because it's so accurate. Okay, so anyways, you can look that up. We'll develop it a little bit uh, in this message. We developed it in a lot more detail on Sunday night when we studied through Daniel. All of that's available online too. So if that's something you want to look at more, you can do that. But let's keep going. We won't get bogged down too much in that. One of the things that we know, one of the reasons this great multitude came to the feast is there was a requirement for Jewish men and their families to come to Jerusalem three times a year. There are three sacred feasts. You can see it described in Exodus there. Um, but but um, many, many people did come. And so this was a time where the city would just swell with population. And this is what we see here. Those feasts, by the way, were the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Passover, the Feast of Harvest or Pentecost. We typically recognize these feasts by the the, the names in the pink there, um, or the Feast of Engathering, or the Feast of Tabernacles, or Booths. Now, this particular feast is the Feast of Passover, very significant, especially in the life of Jesus Christ, but very significant to the nation, because if you call, recall, this was a, a plague. This was actually a the 10th plague and a series of 10 plagues where God delivers his people from uh, the nation of Egypt. Egypt had them in slavery. This is all recorded back in Exodus chapter 12. And what he did is God took a life. He, he killed someone in every household in Egypt that night. You know, that judgment fell on every household of Egypt. And here was the point. God said, judgment's going to fall on every household. But if you take a lamb, and there was requirements for it, a male without blemish, and you slaughter that lamb, you keep it in your house for 14 days, you slaughter it, you cook it a certain way, and then you apply the blood to the doorpost. Guess what? My death angel that I'm sending, he will pass over your house. <laughs> Why? Because judgment's already fallen. It just didn't fall on the firstborn in that house. Who did it fall on? It fell on the lamb. Does that ring any connections for you in the New Testament? It's just incredible. This is, this is exactly why when Jesus died for you, it's very significant. Because the Bible says you and I deserved death. The wages of sin is death. That means you and I deserve hell if God gives us what we deserve. But because Jesus took our penalty for us, God is able to pass over us and not execute that justice on us. This is why the Bible says we're saved by grace, by the way, because God gave Jesus what you deserve so that he's free to give you something you don't deserve. That's grace. And this is a great picture in the Passover. Now, by the way, I thought you might find this interesting. William Barclay, who's a New Testament uh, commentator, says that on one occasion, they actually took a census of the amount of lambs that they killed in one Passover feast. Listen to this. You ready for this? 250,000 lambs in this one census that they took in first century Israel. So if you take families and extended families who would typically gather around one lamb, one feast, and celebrate together, if you just average 10 people per lamb, you're looking at over 2.5 million people who are in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So you can see it just swells. These are huge crowds that we're talking about. And one of the things we see as we go forward is they actually give Jesus a messianic greeting. And so part of you reads this and you're like, wow, they're getting it. Man, they're, they're on it. They're, they're finally seeing what's true. But we're going to see that there were some misunderstandings about the, what, what the Messiah was going to do. And there was misunderstandings in terms of recognizing what he was all about. And um, we'll see that as we go. But look at, look at this phrase. When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. And so you see this popularity of Jesus was astounding. He's had levels, uh, like bumps and, 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 and dips, so to speak, in his popularity throughout his ministry. But you know what just happened in John chapter 11? He just rose a man from the dead. That kind of will make you popular with most people. That's kind of a, an odd occurrence, a pretty incredible miracle. And so this is exactly um, why he's at this, this heightened level of popularity. And so what it seems like is as the multitudes go to Jerusalem for the feast, 
They hear in the grapevine that Jesus is now walking in from Bethany and they run out toward Bethany to meet him along the way. This is kind of the scenario that John paints for us here. One of the things that we know just from culture, um, you know, if someone took a palm branch now, I'd think like they were trying to spank me. You know, that sounds like something my mom would do growing up. Like, I see her with a palm branch or a paddle. She used to, I'm sorry, mom, I'm going to sell you out here. My mom's here too. Um, she used to take those, well, and in fairness to her, okay, now I'm, I'm just getting all wrapped up in my mind here. She broke a couple of rulers on my brother and I growing up because the, they were those plastic rulers, probably not from Dollar Tree because I don't think that existed then, but, but the plastic, they would just snap in half. So she moved to the wooden spoons. And I just, I remember even coming into the kitchen sometimes and I would see her with the wooden spoon. I was just mentally calculate, okay, have I done anything wrong recently? Because <laughs> I, I was like, I don't know if she's cooking or she's coming after me, you know, or whatever. But, you know, palm, tr- palm branches may not mean a lot to us, but in the Jewish day, it was a nationalistic and patriotic thing. This, for the average first century Jew, it was nationalistic Jewish hope, and it represented messianic hope that the Messiah would come. He would one day deliver us from Gentile oppression. And so they're, they're, they are in some ways making a, a, a messianic declaration here. It's pretty, pretty interesting to see this. It was very common. It might be like going to a 4th of July play parade. And what do we see people waving? American flags, right? So it's the, kind of the concept here with the palm branches. Um, needless to say, whatever their motivation was, they were revved up. They're pretty pumped. And we're going to see that uh, borne out because Notice what they, they cry out. This is interesting. We'll kind of look at this in more detail. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Um, cried out means to cry out, and it's an onomatopoeia. I had to throw that in there. That was one of my favorite words in uh, youth English growing up. I, uh, you know, But onomatopoeia, imitating the horse cry of a raven, it means that the word in the Greek sounds like what, it, what it's doing, right? It's an onomatopoeia. It's kind of a fun word to say. Um, the idea though here is they're really screaming. They're, they're really getting into it. Okay. They're, it's a hoarse cry of a raven. And not only that, but we pick up in the Greek language, it's in the imperfect tense, which means it was ongoing action. They kept on saying it. And it was like, as one person said it, probably someone else spoke up a little bit louder and someone else spoke up a little bit louder. And it was like a, just a revved up crowd saying what we're reading here. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now, this word Hosanna is, is an interesting word in the Greek language. It's got Aramaic roots, but it's really an interjection, right? It's a, it's a, it's a statement. It's, it's like a, a very, um, what would you say, just emphatic statement. And the word itself means save now, help now, or save, we pray. It's, it, it, they're looking for immediate action. Hosanna, save now, help now is kind of the idea that you see here. In fact, by this time, it had formed into more of a liturgical form of praise. Okay. This was part of a, a group of Psalms. And you can write this down if you like Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. Those Psalms right there were often, uh, sang, uh, as, uh, by the temple choir as they kind of approached the temple, uh, during these feast times. They were sang in all of these feasts. In fact, it was part of the first memory work of, uh, memory work of every Jewish boy in the nation. They had to memorize Psalm 113 to 118. It was one of the first things that they memorized. So it was a very familiar saying. They all knew what they were saying. And so again, it's, it's messianic in terms of their expectation. But in this specific context, what's the crowd asking Jesus to save them from or to help them with? I think that's always a wise question to, to ask when you see the word salvation in the Bible. Because many of us, when we see salvation, we automatically think from hell. It's used differently in the Bible. We, I think we know that. It's just like every time you see fire in the Bible, it's not talking about hell. Every time you see water in the Bible, it's not talking about baptism, right? These are things we just naturally assume all the time, just, just based on our background or just maybe not a careful looking at the text. So what, is it, what are they looking uh, for Jesus to save them from or to help them with in this context? I think based on their nationalistic message, what they're asking him to do is just to deliver them from Rome's dominion. This is what they want. They want out from under the thumb of Rome. They know that the Messiah is going to do that one day. They're believing that Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, save us. Get us out of here. Deliver us from Rome. We know earlier in Jesus's ministry, uh, in John 6, right, if immediately following the feeding of the 5,000, 
Notice what Jesus does. He, he actually runs from popularity. It's crazy. You know, someone wants to make me king for a day. I'm going to have a hard time walking away from that. That sounds like a good deal, right? You mean sit on a lawn chair and just have someone fill up my, my drink and bring me grapes, right? Okay, I could do that for a little bit. Jesus runs from that. Notice what it says in John 6, 15. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. So this has been an ongoing thought as people have been watching and witnessing Jesus's miracles. They're like, this is the Messiah, right? Let's force him to come deliver us from the Romans. That's kind of their mindset. So um, that, that is probably going on here too. That's probably the mindset as they pray and sing Hosanna. By the way, also based on the next phrase, which we'll look at next, but this idea that blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, it's clear that they're quoting from Psalm 118. We're going to pull that up here in a second. Again, just a psalm of declarative praise. It's used as a festive procession to the temple. It's this excitement as they're walking up to the temple. This group led by the choir would sing all of these psalms. And so let me pull up Psalm 118, 25 through 26. Notice the first word, save now. That's Hosanna. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Prosperity meaning what? Get the Gentiles out of here and let us have our land. Let us enjoy the prosperity that you've designed for us in your kingdom. And then notice this next phrase, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. Now, what's amazing about this crowd is as they're escorting Jesus into Jerusalem, here's what they don't understand. They are now escorting and leading a festive procession procession escorting the Lamb of God to the ultimate and final sacrifice. They just don't know this at this point. They're they're doing exactly what the Psalm wants them to do, which is to escort the Messiah to Jerusalem, singing praise to his name. They just are not figuring out that his death is going to be involved in there somewhere and that his reign is now postponed due to the the rejection of the nation of Jesus. And so we'll kind of keep developing this further. Blessed is he who comes uh, in the name of the Lord, the word blessed simply means to praise, to, to bless, or to speak well of. By the way, what's been happening in the life of Jesus, everywhere he turns, he's got some people that bless him and speak well of him, but he's got the majority of the nation doing what? Rejecting him. Go back and read, uh, go back and read some of these interactions with the Pharisees. They don't, they don't see any value in Jesus. They, they've completely rejected him. They don't want him. In fact, we looked at, uh, we jumped out of the John last week, but we looked at that concept of a cornerstone. And what did God predict in the Old Testament? He's going to say the, the stone that the builders rejected, I'm going to make the chief cornerstone. They thought it was worthless. I think it's key to my building project, the church. And so this is what's going on. So the, this blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This was a messianic phrase um, in Jesus's day. They're speaking well of the one who is on mission from Yahweh himself. They believe that he's the Messiah, or at least they're declaring this. Now, again, we get into the motives of these, of these people. We don't actually know all of their motives. The text doesn't tell us. But at least in the verbiage, they're declaring him to be the Messiah. By the way, this should have been the response of every Jew living in Israel in the first century to the life and ministry of Jesus. It's, this should have been the response of all of them. Jesus did so many miracles. John is going to tell us later in the book that he did way more than he could even record that there wouldn't even be enough books to fill all the miracles that Jesus did. We, we joke off the time, what are we going to do when we get to heaven? I, I, if the Lord is taking requests, I don't know if you, I don't think you will be. Um, I would like to just sit down and see all the miracles Jesus did. I'd like to see the ones we missed that weren't recorded. Can you, I mean, if you're impressed with Jesus now, based on what you've got written in the gospels and what he did and who he is and what he accomplished. Just imagine when you have the full story. We don't even have the full story. That ought to blow our minds. So if you're impressed with Jesus, I hope you're more impressed with him now. So maybe maybe if I can talk the Lord into that, maybe you can sit by me if you want to watch that, because I would love to see that. It's incredible. Just, it's like watching more feats of your hero, right? Like, man, go. <laughs> That was awesome. But you got to understand, there's much more than we have recorded, much more that people witnessed. This should have been the response of every Jew. And this is exactly what Jesus was trying to overwhelmingly convince his audience of through his teaching, 
through his miracles, I am the Messiah. I am the one who's coming in the name of the Lord. I'm here. This is why early in the ministry, John the Baptist's message and Jesus' message was what? Repent, change your mind. Why? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's ready to establish his kingdom. But we see that the Jews rejected him and thus that kingdom has now been postponed. They also call him the king of Israel. Again, just a jubilant coronation, if you will, the messianic king from David's line. Now, some of this, I think that a lot of hearts in this crowd were pure. I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. Some of this crowd may have even been believers. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt, maybe more than some. Many of them believe that he would establish his kingdom reign on earth from Jerusalem. But one of the things that we're going to see is they were in for a rude awakening because they didn't understand prophecy. They didn't understand what the Lord had predicted. They might have even understood what we showed earlier in Daniel 9.25. You might have had an astute Jew, you know, type in, well, they didn't have calculators, but like an abacus or whatever they had, calculating this thing. Ooh, it's it's about time. They do say historically that the first century Jewish, the average first century Jewish person had a very heightened expectation of the Messiah. So there was probably a little understanding of this prophecy in Daniel 9, but they they missed the rest of Daniel 9. Let's look at that now, because they are going to be in for a rude awakening here, and we'll see. The, the sad irony of all this is it was predicted in accurate detail in the prophecy of Daniel 70 weeks. We've already looked at verse 25. Let's kind of break down the details a little bit so you, we've got a better understanding of what was predicted, how they could have known, and then what they missed following this prediction. But Daniel 9.25 says this. You could turn in your Bibles there if you want to. I'm going to pull these up on the screen. But Daniel 9.25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, until Messiah the Prince, there should be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, this takes a little bit of investigative work to understand. I'll, I'll, I'll admit that. Um, and the reason for that is this word weeks, if, if you would just circle that word weeks, all that word, we hear weeks and what do we think? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So we think seven days, right? So we think s- Seven weeks or 49 days, that's how we see it. But this word weeks um, in the Hebrew means a unit of seven, okay? It functions like our word dozen, right? If I was just real quickly uh, just to tell, hey, Andy, I need something. Can you go get me a dozen? What would his question be? A dozen of what? Like, do I need a dozen water bottles? Do I need, you know, uh, what do I need? A dozen of what, right? So that's actually the question we should ask. We see seven weeks or seven units of seven, seven units of seven what? That's the question we ask. You start kind of taking this. Now, we have the benefit of looking back, okay, and looking how history has unfolded. But it's very clear, and we'll develop, again, we develop this further in more detail in our Daniel study on Sunday night. So if you're interested in doing that. But I would make the argument that the unit of seven is seven years, okay? Seven units of seven years, all right? Let's just kind of walk through this then because then we got 62 units of seven years. And hang with me, I'm going to do all the math for us. I I know that it's like over half the population hates math. I get it. So hang hang in there with me. But here's the math. Seven weeks, it's seven times seven years, 49 years. There's 62 weeks, 62 times seven years, 434 years. So the total time from this command, whatever it is, we'll talk about this in a second, to Messiah is 483 years, okay? Now the question begins. So, all right, so we've got the time frame between this command to rebuild and restore Jerusalem until Messiah. We've got the time frame in between those events. When did the stopwatch start? In other words, what command is he talking about? Well, it's really interesting as you look through even Old Testament history and even secular history, but you can find this in the Old Testament. There were multiple commands by Persian kings to go back to Jerusalem and restore and rebuild the temple. But there was only one command to go back and restore and build the city and the city walls. And we have a book that we always study, right? Nehemiah, Nehemiah up on the walls, right? Or son, there's all sorts of titles for that story. That's the command we're looking at. And that command began uh, in 444 BC, March 5th. It was given by the Persian king, Artaxerxes. And when you take that and you stop the stopwatch, you fast forward it 483 years from that date, 
it brings us to Palm Sunday. The exact Sunday that we're looking at right now in the book of John to the exact date. That's the math that Harold Honer, I mentioned earlier, did. He can kind of show you how he got there. He just reveals how, how he just calculated it. Real simple. One of the keys to calculating that is using the amount of days in a year that they used in Daniel's day, which was not 365. It was 360. And that's one of the keys to understanding this prophecy. And so you see, this is exactly predicted. It's the very entrance in Jerusalem that the prophet Daniel predicted. The phrase, until Messiah the Prince, I believe represents Jesus' official presentation to the nation. So this is incredibly accurate. The astute Jew, if there was an astute Jew at that time, they could have potentially calculated it, got it, got into that and just knew that in their lifetime, they would see the Messiah. In fact, the two people that saw baby Jesus in the temple, right? One of the promises, I think his name was Simeon, right? He, he was promised that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. So he knew it was going to be in his generation. Whether they knew it was this exact day, that's, that's a debate, but, but it, you can calculate it to the exact day. But you'll see there were some other things that God did here that are just incredible to try to convince them. And we'll look at that as we go forward. Here, here it is. We're going to see this in verse 14 and 15. I'll mention it now. There's another identifiable and visible action prophesied about that he would be riding on the foal of a donkey. We're going to see that in verses 14 through 15. Again, notice that 15 is in italics. He's quoting the Old Testament here. This is a prophecy that they could have known. But then Daniel 9 takes an unexpected turn. Okay, we've looked at Daniel 9.25. And this turn that it takes in 926 baffled Jewish theologians. In fact, it baffles Jews to this day. The problem is what the Jew will say is if Jesus was the Messiah, where's the kingdom? That's their argument. When the Messiah came, there was going to be a kingdom. If Jesus was the Messiah, where's the kingdom? That's their argument. That's where they get hung up today. But notice what they're missing in Daniel 9 uh, in this same prophecy. We've already done 925, but let's read it again. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, notice that next phrase, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And that's what they were ignoring. That's what they weren't seeing is this concept that he would be cut off. And, and it's like when we see a, a, a difficult Bible verse, we just, we just want someone to tell us like, well, that's not really what it is in the original, right? We're like, that's not in the Greek. You know, that's not, no, that's a bad translation. We, we want that sometimes. And sometimes it's not, it's actually very clear. He's going to be cut off, but they were just trying to gloss past that because their mind was on a coming king, a reigning king, a kingdom. They're like, wait, what's all this cut off thing? Uh, I don't know. We'll ask him when he gets here kind of deal. Like we don't want to, we don't even want to think about it now. And so Daniel's prophecy predicted this. This is what he predicts. Following the presentation of the Messiah to the nation, he would be cut off or killed. And guess what? Daniel's prophecy was true in that regard too, because five days after Palm Sunday, Jesus is going to have to go through six sham trials. He's going to be convicted as a capital offender, and he's going to be murdered that Friday. Exactly the way Daniel predicted it. To the day he would be presented to the nation, it took him five days to cut him off from that prophecy. Everything Daniel said would happen is going to happen. And so, by the way, as all this hoopla is going around him, you think Jesus knows what the end game is? Yeah, he knows what the end game is. He's watching these people say, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he. And he just knows that there might be people in this very crowd in five days are going to be the ones yelling, crucify him, crucify him. His blood be upon our heads and our children's heads. We have no king but Caesar, right? Same people. And so you can see that Jesus, uh, it actually breaks his heart because it gives us incredible insight. I'm going to jump out of John for just a second. I'll pull this up. You can just write it down. But it gives us incredible insight as to why Jesus responded the way he did after he got into Jerusalem following this triumphal entry. Because you would think like, you know, you would think coming into town, everyone's like basically saying, Jesus, you're the man. Yeah, you're the man. You're the man. Ah, you're the man. You know, screaming, excited. You would think that Jesus probably felt like the man. But you're going to see as a totally different response. And it's based on what he understands is going to happen 
the divine timing of his life, his death, his resurrection, his future reign, et cetera, et cetera. And this is why we read in Luke 9, 41 through 44. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. Look at that. In fact, I, I, I didn't count them, but I think there's only two times you find Jesus crying in the New Testament. One at the response of Mary's emotion at Lazarus's death, right? We looked at that in John 11 and here. He's weeping over the city. Why? Because he also knows something else that's going to happen to them in the future because they've rejected him. But notice what he says, saying, if you had known, how would they have known? They paid close attention to Daniel 9. If they had known this, even you, especially in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you. By the way, he's describing the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70 here. He's predicting this destruction. For days will come when you and your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, close you in on every side and level you and your children with you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another. And then notice this next phrase and think of Daniel 9, because you did not know the time of your visitation. You didn't recognize when the Messiah was being presented to you is kind of the idea. And this caused Jesus to weep. He wasn't like, oh, you're going to get yours one day. You rejected me. You're going to be. It, it, this brought him no pleasure. He wept over it. He was tragically impacted by the fact that he knew the judgment that was coming on them. By the way, it also is an interesting thing. Again, following the triumphal entry, heading, having landed in Jerusalem after that, he says, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, I might add, including the Messiah, they, they reject the one whom, who is sent to them. They rejected the Messiah. He, notice his heart for the nation. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her, his, her wings, but you were not willing. I wanted to bring you close. <laughs> I wanted to protect you. I wanted to be your king. I wanted to be your savior. I wanted to take care of you. But see, your house has left you desolate. That's what we just read about in Luke. And then notice this. This is really a weird thing to say. For I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I thought they just said that. I thought, I thought they literally just said, that's what we read in John. They literally just said that. But now he's saying, you're not going to see me until you say it. And I would say, uh, and mean it, or, or understand what you're saying, maybe is what we could say here. And that is going to come for the nation as a whole. They're going to receive him as their Messiah at his second coming. We read all about that in Zechariah. When he appears in the clouds to them, it says that the Jewish nation is going to recognize the one whom they pierced. Another incredible prophecy, by the way, written hundreds of years before Jesus was crucified and even before the Romans were in power and used crucifixion. The Old Testament says they're going to recognize the one they pierced, not stoned, not slit his throat, the one they, they pierced. And it says all of the tribes of Israel are going to mourn at that point because they're going to know that their forefathers had killed the Messiah, that they had fulfilled Daniel 9, 26a. And so this is going to happen at his second coming. Now, all of that in, in, taken into consideration, there's additional fulfilled prophecy here in this passage, which is just amazing. Verses 14 through 15 says this, then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, fear not daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And so this is John's summary statement. By the way, we get more detail in the other gospel accounts, right? John just kind of says, Hey, hey, Jesus found a young donkey. He doesn't tell you how he found it. He doesn't go through the details. But if we look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, some of those details are this. Jesus, we know, sent two of his disciples into a village near Bethany. They picked up a mother donkey. They picked up a young baby donkey or a colt. We know that. But we know that when they were going to release them, what did Jesus tell them? Right then, the owner is going to say, hey, what are you guys doing? Looks like you're stealing my animals, right? And Jesus said, hey, when that happens... Just tell this man, the Lord has need of him. The Lord has need of him and he'll let you go. And guess what happened? Exactly how Jesus described it for even for them to get this donkey. 
And so we learn from verse 15. We also learn from Matthew 21, 4, if we were to turn over there, that the reason Jesus utilized a specific method of transportation at this specific time was it was in fulfillment of Zechariah 9, 9, also given as a help to identify him to the nation of Israel. So you see what God is doing. God is working over time to show the nation, this is your Messiah. He gave them the countdown, the time frame in Daniel 9. Now he says, he's riding in on a donkey. They should have seen this and said, oh, wow, this is all coming together. And I think some of them might have been. Some of them were just caught up in the rush of a revved up crowd. But you would think that this would just be incredible to them. By the way, before we move on, just as a a subtle note, look at that very last phrase in verse 14. You'll see it um, as it is written, as is written. You'll see that a lot in the New Testament. I just want to bring this out. It's typically how New Testament authors would communicate that they're quoting from the Old Testament as it is written, um, or even in our, uh, yeah, in our passage, it's it's also as it is written. Um, The idea, and because it's used this way, it it is used in the perfect tense. And the idea is that it was recorded before and it remains beneficial to us in our day. It's just a beautiful way the New Testament authors are always, as they're quoting Old Testament, saying, yeah, this is the Old Testament, but it's still relevant. There's still some relevancy here is what he's saying. Now, God is trying to communicate the nation of Israel. I like the, the idea of he's leading bread, breadcrumbs along the way, right? He's leading breadcrumbs. And in some instances, he's leaving the entire loaf of bread. And I, and I think this is one of those instances. He's just leaving it out for him to follow. Zechariah 9, 9 says this, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, uh, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so it's very interesting as you look at history because in the, in the ancient Near East, rulers only rode donkeys into towns when they came in peace. If they came in war, they typically rode a horse. In fact, you skip all the way to Revelation 19 at Jesus is coming when the Antichrist has taken over the city of Jerusalem. He's ravishing households. He's, he's robbing from the Jews. Jesus doesn't come on a donkey then. He comes on a white horse because he's fixing to do business. He's fixing to start plucking guys into the lake of fire. If you read Revelation 19, that's where the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to end up. So he comes on a horse. Here he's coming on a donkey. And so again, for the astute Israelite, this is verifiable prophecy being played out right in front of their eyes. Uh, Seeing this might have even been part of the reason why the crowd is getting pumped up. They might have, oh, he's riding on a donkey. That's huge. That's Zechariah 9. You just don't know what's going on, but they're getting revved up. But it's, it's, hard to, it, it, it's hard to believe that they got it based on what we're going to see John say next. John steps in like he does. He's going to provide an editorial comment. It's like, this is what was going on. And he's like, let me pause the story there. Let me tell you how we were thinking when that was going on. Let me tell you what we knew and understood and what we didn't know and understand. This is what John is going to do um, here in verse 16. By the way, because they don't understand, it's most likely that most of the people probably didn't understand. But again, that's a little bit of speculation, but it's definitely possible. And I'll make an argument why, but they are not making the connection, right? Here's, here's the point, And they're just, they're taking a right exit. You know, <laughs> they're, they're not hitting the point. They're not getting the point. And John basically admits this. He says in verse 16, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and they had done these things to him. The word understand that John uses is gnosko. It means to begin to know, to come to know. It means to gain or receive knowledge. The idea is that they were not uh, taking the knowledge they had and like adding to it and making connections to what they were seeing um, in the present. Basically, as the events were unfolding in real time, they weren't making the connection. They they thought it was cool. They were, I mean, sure, there's a lot of people out here screaming <laughs> for Jesus. They probably thought that was cool. But in terms of making the direct connection, as to what was going on, how God intended them to understand the prophecies, they weren't, they weren't connecting there. They weren't making it. Now, I want to just make a point here real quickly, because the disciples had received more direct revelation from Jesus Christ than any person on planet earth before or since. These guys had received it all. And it's just amazing because they're still missing the connections. They, they literally had exposure to the best teacher that the world has ever seen. They had him for three years. 
They walked with him. They asked him questions. I don't understand what that means. Can you explain this to me? This, this, this. They went on and on. They saw everything he did. And yet, even as they're standing there, they're just caught up in the parade. They're like, this is awesome. Man, this is great. They're pumped, just like everybody else, but they're not making these connections. They're not connecting it to the word of God. By the way, as an application, if I can just make a Christian life application, this is why it's great to sit under sound Bible teaching. It's great. You want to you wanna position yourself to sit under sound Bible teaching, period. Wherever you're at, if you move to Alaska, where it doesn't matter on earth. You as a believer cannot grow spiritually unless you're sitting under sound Bible teaching. I would make that argument till the day I die. But here's the thing. Just sitting under sound Bible teaching is not going to make you spiritual. You and I have to have an individual response, repeated responses of faith and agreement with the word of God, because I'm telling you, and I, maybe I'm being hard on myself, but maybe you can relate. I don't wake up in the morning just automatically thinking biblically. I need the word of God to bump me. I need the word of God to bump my thinking. I need the word of God to challenge the way that I'm responding to anybody in my life. I need the word of God to, to correct my, my misunderstanding of everyone else. I need the word of God to take me out of the realm of judging everyone else's motives toward me and actually walking by means of the spirit, not being distracted by others, having my mind and my focus occupied with Jesus Christ. By the way, if you're occupied with the Lord, oftentimes horizontal relationships tend to find a way to work themselves out. You're giving people the benefit of the doubt. You're actually loving people. First Corinthians 13 says that you love hopes all things. You know what that means? It means I give people the benefit of the doubt. It means when my wife does something that frustrates me or I do something that frustrates her, it's more like, yeah, it's more that time <laughs> than, than the first. It's we, we've learned over the years to give each other the benefit of the doubt. That's probably not what she meant. That's probably not what he meant. We need to do that with one another too. This is, these are the one another's of scripture. And so there's opportunities to take in sound Bible teaching, but we want it to reshape our thinking. We want it to renew our mind as the Bible says. We want it to be valuable in the way that 2 Timothy 3.16 says it's valuable. I, I, I kid you not, sometimes in the way I live my life, I look at 2 Timothy 3.16 and I say, all scripture is valuable because it confirms what I already believe. That's not what the verse says. It says it's valuable, it's profitable for what? For doctrine, for correction, for rebuke, and for instruction in righteousness. By the way, three of those are kind of with the implication that you don't think right, I don't think right, that we need adjustment. And that's the value of the word of God. So these guys are getting it. They're still missing the point is kind of my point in looking at them. By the way, they will make connections later. This is what John comes back to say in verse 16. He says, when Jesus was glorified, they remembered these things. And what John recalls here is something that the disciples uh, did not connect until after his resurrection, maybe his ascension. We don't really know what John meant about glorified. Was it after his resurrection or after his ascension? But anyways, definitely after his resurrection, and probably after his ascension when the spirit of God was sent. I'll make that argument here in a second. Um, but then they remembered. And, and this word remember means exactly what we think. It's recalling information from memory. But here's what's interesting about the word. And it kind of fits with something Jesus will teach later in, in, in the upper room discourse. It's used in the passive voice. The idea is there's an outside source that acted upon them to cause them to remember. Okay. It wasn't like they just got in a room and they just like, okay, I got to remember, you know, you know, smacking their head, just making it happen. It said an outside source brought to remembrance these things and started to make sense of these things. And I believe, um, jumping a little bit ahead here, that the person that's doing that, this outside source that's acting on them is none other than the indwelling Holy Spirit. Because this is what we read in John 14 when we get there, John 16 when we get there, uh, 14, 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. 16, 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. By the way, this is the exact reason we trust that the word of God is the word of God because the spirit of God is moving these men along to record exactly what he wants recorded. He's the one bringing these memories to their mind. And so we see this uh, illustrated here, even in John's recognition at this point, that this is why now, years later, he can make the connection to these things. But what does the Spirit of God 
wanting to bring to their remembrance. So what has he brought to their remembrance now? Two things are mentioned. First, he says these things were written about him. Uh, you know, making that connection to the Old Testament, specifically Psalm 118, Daniel 9.25, Zechariah 9.9, all of these things had been written about him and they were actually living, um, living this out, living through these prophecies being fulfilled. And then we see the second thing, that they had done these things to him, okay? So once they realize or remember the Old Testament writings, the, t- the scriptures, the prophecies, they connected these events to the prophetic words. And so this is what the Spirit of God has done for them. Uh, it's amazing. They, they probably didn't realize it. It, it would have been a nice thing to realize in the moment because uh, you imagine literally being on earth the moment a biblical prophecy is fulfilled and you actually get to see it live and in person. Isn't that what we're hoping, by the way, for the rapture? Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be cool? As, as we're heading up in the sky, we're like, dude, it's happening. You do that, it's happening. Like, we're in this thing. Like, man, we're right in the middle of this. We get to experience it. And so they had missed out on that, uh, on that benefit. Now, even in the moment, you know, you see all these people excited, this huge crowd. And so uh, they're still excited, even though they didn't recognize all the details of what's going on, even though they weren't making the connections. Now, one of the groups that was, that was ramping people up was a group who had witnessed Lazarus's resurrection. We read about them in verses 17 through 18. It says, therefore, the people, John kind of returns to the narrative now, therefore, the people who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. So again, this group seemed to be leading the charge. They were testifying of Jesus. They were saying, I was there when he pulled Lazarus out of the grave. Lazarus was dead four days. I was there. I was grieving with the family. He was done. He was wrapped. He was mummified. He had been treated. He was in the tomb. They'd rolled the stone. (laughs) I was there. Jesus brought him back to life. And so they're giving this testimony. It's interesting because once again, John, and we see this through the book, he uses legal terminology all throughout the book. This is legal terminology. By the way, how many people were bearing witness? At least two but it's, it seems to indicate many, many more. How many legal witnesses did you need in Jewish law to, to believe that something was true? You only needed two or three. So they had an overabundance of witnesses. And by the way, um, they couldn't shut up. They could not stop talking about this. We see this in this phrase, bore witness. It's in the imperfect tense. They kept on giving ongoing testimony. They kept on giving verbal witness of Jesus Christ, who he was, what he had done regarding Lazarus. In fact, it seems like this miracle, and it's probably why John saved it for the seventh, what it did more to convince people of Jesus than anything. Because we see, based on their testimony, look at that next phrase in the verse, for this reason, for this reason, this, this witness, the people also met him. In other words, they came back out of Jerusalem to meet him along the way from Bethany because they heard that he had done this sign. And so it was due to their ongoing witness. And again, We don't know. It may have been a spiritual response. Maybe they're believing in him for eternal life. Maybe they're just believing in him to conquer the Romans. We don't really know. It's hard to speculate. We don't get a a lot of details here. It's hard to understand. But one of the things that we see is there's this excitement. This crowd is building, but there's an element in the crowd that's not excited and not happy. And I'll give you one guess as to who they are. We we know who they are because they always show up this way. Um, they're, They're the perpetual Eeyore. You know, they can't find their tail. You know, they're They're just upset all the time, and that's the Pharisees. And so we'll kind of close out this morning in verse 19. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you're accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Therefore, again, refers to this ongoing verbal testimony, witnesses of Lazarus's resuscitation, and then the ongoing testimony of the crowd, right? They're making messianic proclamations here, or declarations with the donkey, with the palm branches, quoting of Psalm 118, et cetera, and those kind of things. And so remember, uh, the Pharisees are upset by this because they had their purpose spelled out. We saw that right at the end of Lazarus's resurrection in John eleven fifty seven. 57. This is what they wanted to do. They had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, speaking of Jesus, he should report it, that they might seize him. So they wanted to get a hold of Jesus. They wanted to try him and if possible, put him to death. For, as Caiaphas said, the sake of the nation, right? We saw that back 
uh, in John chapter 11 too. So the Pharisees, by the way, um, notice they said among themselves, okay? And, and was, I, I love this because you got a group of people together and, and as one person starts speaking up, he's like, your plan, all of your plan is terrible. And it was his plan too. <laughs> Someone on that side of the room then says, no, no, yeah, I agree. All of your plans, they're, they're not including themselves. They're pointing at all the group. We have a tendency to do that too, but they, they're scolding themselves. They're scolding themselves for not devising a plan that would accomplish their purposes. They scold themselves in two ways. This word you see, it, it's actually a command. It's not just an observation. It's a command. It functions like a declarative statement. It's, the idea is to study closely and look, at, uh, look hard at how your plan, really our plan, is not working, right? This is the idea. We need to look at this closely because this ain't working. Don't act like it is. Nothing is happening here. In fact, accomplishing means to be useful, profitable. Nothing means not even one or not even the least. Uh, basically, they're saying our plan is a train wreck. This is not working one iota. Uh, there's an old saying from the military. Some of you might be familiar with this, but it says the plan only survives first contact with reality. And that's kind of what they're seeing here. They had a plan. It ain't working. It seems like it's going the opposite direction. Their plan is just uh, not doing very well. And so the second way they scold themselves is here. It says, look, the world has gone after him. Look is simply a prompter of attention. It means look here or pay attention to what's going on. They're probably standing apart from the crowd as they're screaming and following Jesus. They're like, look, I mean, this, the whole world is going after them. Everyone's going after them. Just a huge crowd following him at this point. And so gone after, it's really an interesting word that the Pharisees use here because it means to go away or depart. The idea, really the focus here is not that they're going after Jesus necessarily, but that they're going away from them. They're going away from Judaism to Jesus. And that's really obviously what they're most concerned about. And they view this worship of Jesus as going backwards, as going away from Yahweh, as going away from their teaching, which they would have considered biblical and going after basically a heretic, a false Messiah. And this is why we don't have it recorded in John, but this is why the Pharisees say this. I just, I just love Jesus. I just love the way he responds to the thing. It's just like, that is just so perfect. But look at, look, this Pharisees called him from the crowd says, teacher, Rebuke your disciples. Why? Because they're saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the highest. They're throwing down palm branches, right? They say, rebuke your disciples. And I loved, this is just amazing. He answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that, I mean, it's just amazing. And you know what? I have a, ten, I have a tendency to believe what Jesus said. Part of me would have loved for them to just be quiet for a second. Hey, let's see if this works, you know? It's like, man, that, that stone is really loud. It's louder than me, you know, kind of deal. Just amazing how, how you even see creation here doing what creation is supposed to do. It's generally when you give the part of the creation with the free will that we don't do what he wants us to do. <laughs> but stones would have followed through here. And so this is the final group, by the way, that uh, misunderstands what is going on in Palm Sunday. The Pharisees aren't making the connection to the scriptures either. They're missing it as well as everybody else. But it's this popularity we're going to see going forward. It's this popularity coming into Jerusalem that actually convinces the Pharisees not to take Jesus during the feast. They don't want to take him now because there's so much popularity going his way that they don't want to, uh, any kind of negative attention. And this is why they say Matthew 26, three through five. Then the leading priests, the older Jewish leaders had a meeting at the palace where the high priest lived. The high priest's name was Caiaphas. In the meeting, they tried to find a way to arrest and kill Jesus without anyone knowing what they were doing. They're looking to do it clandestinely. They plan to arrest Jesus and kill him. But notice what they said. We cannot arrest Jesus during Passover. We don't want the people to become angry and cause a riot. What they didn't know at this point is that there's a traitor in the inner circle of Jesus ready to betray him. In fact, um, some commentators have argued that the reason Judas, the last straw for Judas was when Jesus came in with the triumphal entry that he didn't dispose of the Romans on Palm Sunday. And he began to consider, I got to get rid of this guy. And so we'll talk more about that, obviously, when we get to John chapter 13. But let's close there uh, this morning with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for um, this passage. Lord, you are incredible the way you predict the future. The future predictions to you is just like us looking at the past. It is incredible. You're accurate. 
um, you're convincing. So we thank you for this just uh, hopefully passage that just builds our faith to see that you had a perfect timing for our Savior. Not only did you have perfect timing, you had a perfect plan with our Savior. Uh, we just rejoice in the Lord Jesus. May we um, leave this morning with just a bounce on our step, thinking about our Savior and who he is and what he accomplished for us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.